if this agreement is not there, then the, the employer is blessed with the prerogative to decide at any time to just, you know, uh, push you to resign. Freedom of contract agreement is actually a legal document. This legal document is signed by both parties in terms of the employer and the employee. And in this uh, document, a business firm states the terms under which it is willing to hire a certain, you know, person or a certain employee. And once the employee signs, the employee is also signing to signify their acceptance and willingness to work under, under the conditions provided by the employer. What is uh, very pathetic is usually uh, the desperate empl uh, prospective employee will not read any terms of the contract. So they would just simply rush to um uh, uh you know sign it simply because they need a job they need a job so like the proverbial Ghanaian you know saying that if you want to hide anything from the uh from the Ghanaian the average Ghanaian you know hide it in a book and he will not find it it is all because we will not take time to read. I mean, you are already desperate looking for a job in the context of, you know, youth unemployment and all that. So as an entry point employee, you do not care any nitty gritties of the contract that has been placed before you. You sign it without hesitation. And usually, if you do that, there may be clauses in there that may come staring back at you later on in your career. There is also the efficiency argument. The efficiency argument stipulates that the success of every business enterprise depends on how we efficiently deploy the resources that we have. Don't forget resources for production includes labor. And labor is the employee. So if the firm would be able to operate efficiently, then efficiency is supposed to be uh, achieved upon optimal usage of the resources available, including labor. So employees and employ employers are supposed to come together and benefit from optimal use of both, uh, uh, I mean, resources in terms of uh, factors of production, labor, land, capital, and all that. So for our efficiency to, to take place, we expect that the employer should combine all factors of production, all resources efficiently to be able to achieve optimum output. Then finally, we have marketing and advertising and product safety. Uh, and this happens everywhere, both in, uh, uh, you know, productive sectors, including, you know, um, almost all the sectors that individuals on this course have uh, been working in. We'll begin with uh, marketing uh, ethics and move on to advertising and then we have what we call the product safety. In marketing, there is this fundamental principle of uh, the fact that consumers are kings in every economy. They are kings and should be treated as kings because they ultimately decide whether to buy a product or not to buy the product. And that is why they are referred to as kings. And so the consumer is blessed with a certain sovereignty. That sovereignty gives him the power, the ultimate power to decide whether to patronize a certain product from a company or not to patronize it. And so we end up ensuring that in marketing, we usually would want to ensure what we call these three major ethical principles. These include fairness or justice. Fairness usually go with justice. How fair 
is the price at which a certain consumer is buying a product. Is it a just price? And then in terms of freedom, how free was the market? The freedom of the uh, uh, consumer uh, choosing from a variety of what? Product. In certain marketing strategies, you are asked to purchase one product before you are able to get the product that you have. Here, freedom is actually reduced from uh, for the uh, consumer. Then, well being, how safe is the product that we are selling? So, marketing experts need to ensure that the prices are fair. The individual consumer or customer has the freedom to choose whatever he wants to buy, and that the product available must be as uh, safe as possible to ensure the well-being of whoever buys or uses the product. This has actually resulted in various marketing ethical frameworks. And these frameworks, uh, prominent among them, is caveat emptor and caveat vendetta. Caveat emptor, also, you know, labeled as buyer beware. Buyer beware explains that the buyer has the full responsibility to judge the quality of the goods that he is buying. So how often do we go to supermarket and take the bottle of water that we want to buy and find out if it is of a higher quality, the expiry date is correct. Most of us ignore that. We just pick it up and we go. But caveat enter emphasize and place the responsibility on each and every consumer to judge and test the quality of the goods that he or she purchase. Then, from the other angle, caveat vendetta place the responsibility on the door, at the doorstep of the seller or the producer. That's why we state that a producer beware or seller beware beware here we explain that the responsibility uh, is on the seller to ensure that he reveals fully the quality of the product that he is selling so you go to full slide like cantamanto and you see the boys with their you know uh, uh, their force just trying to make sure that he uh, exhibits the quality of the uh, second-hand clothing that he's selling to you. And you tell each other, this, this is very good. This is cotton. This is cotton. And the label is there. He is only trying to emphasize and reveal in fullest the quality of the goods that he's selling to you. Now, in terms of all these doctrines, uh, the advocacy has been that Consumers are sovereign, they have power, and so they are supposed to be protected. So sometimes some nations would, you know, set up certain product safety commissions who are, you know, giving the power to issue standards, to issue required warnings uh, when there are fake or defective goods, and uh, also try as much as possible to ban dangerously defective product entirely from the market. Such commissions in Ghanaian context could be referenced to uh, Food and Drugs Authority. You can have Ghana Standard Authority. They have the, um, the power by law to issue these standards and to sound you know, warnings when there are fake goods. Unfortunately, they will sound the warnings, but usually they will not tell you where these fake goods are. If you are already consuming it, you may not know. And then also, they are supposed to ban dangerous products entirely from the market. Then we have labeling. Labeling has to do with advertising. You know, labeling is supposed to uh, uh, be dealing with packaging and the information that are put, uh, you know, posted on the packaging. In the United States, the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act 
was, you know, uh, uh, instituted as part of the First Amendment uh, in 1966. And this act required that containers of every product disclosed, for instance, in terms of food product or, yes, uh, food and beverage products, uh, the ingredients that are used in preparing the product, the amount of this ingredient, and any pertinent information, including nutritional content, in the case of food. So you see, tobacco companies would always write information about the nicotine content and the danger and risk associated with that. If you take this Bell Aqua, you have, not to advertise for Bell Aqua, but that's what I'm drinking, you would have almost all the labelings there. Unfortunately, most of us consumers will not take time to look at all these things. In terms of advertising, advertising has to do with communicating uh, about an organization and the product they have available 